Hey, Don. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Let's get down to it, really. Uh, I think you are a very simple guy to talk to from what I've seen from your interview. So uh, I like that. I like uh, the simplicity and the direct <laughs> uh, <laughs> communication. I try to. I try. Yeah, I, I don't think you try. Uh, honestly, I think you flow. Thank I you. I appreciate that, it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I have to say this before we start that some of your interviews, and I mean it, I really mean that, and I, 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 re, I, really, I really watched a lot of interviews from Joe Rogan or from other guys from the web, but some of your interviews, especially you've chosen some characters in your podcast, and the way you ask the questions, I don't know what it is, but uh, the way you flow and the way you are direct and uh, the interviewee, the, the other guy, always opens up with you, and mm. I've seen that uh, time and time again. So before we start, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. You know, um, you, you know, I really enjoy doing the podcast. I've been doing them for, uh, I think, over five years now. And it was never something that I really uh, thought much about doing. It was never something that I planned to do for a long period of time. It was just something that happened and I kind of just ran with it. And uh, in terms of, you know, I've, I've had some very nice things uh, said about my ability to interview people and to chat to people and to be honest it's not like uh, th there's not much of a conscious um uh thought that i put into it in terms of what i'm doing you know it's not that i've read any books or done any studying about communication or or, or interview skills or anything like that it's just something that you know fortunately comes relatively natural to me i definitely think that it's something to do with you know I'm, I'm i'm generally a pretty sociable guy anyway and uh extrovert guy so um you know i think a lot of that does come obviously it's it's you know definitely something that i have naturally or from growing up but i started jiu-jitsu very young uh relatively young and i was uh, you know 14 15 years old straight into adult classes so when your, your regular sort of 14 15 year old teenager doesn't spend a huge amount of time communicating with adults. Um, and I definitely think that the fact that I was in an environment where I was the only kid there amongst a lot of adults, I think that that really helped develop my um, social skills to uh, maybe a more mature level um, earlier on and get maybe gave me a little bit of a head start in, in talking to people. And I think language is interesting. I think communication is interesting. And, you know, part of, of, of what I love about teaching martial arts and I actually enjoy teaching anything but martial arts is what I know the best and to, to a lesser degree or, or maybe not a lesser degree but in another way some particular subjects of strength and conditioning where, where I'm able to pass on my knowledge there as well I enjoy the process of being able to communicate ideas and I think that that helps when it comes to interviewing people so a lot of people have, have, have asked me how do I interview good like you do and I don't yeah. really have an answer to that question my answer would be spend a lot of time talking to people and you know thankfully speech and communication is something that we can practice for free um you don't have to do it on a podcast you can you know talk to someone in the street or you can go and talk to you know an old friend and and actually you know one of the things that i like about podcasts and and and, and the reason why I make sure I do all my podcasts in person and also I, my podcasts are long form. They're usually, you know, rarely less than two hours. And sometimes the last podcast I recorded was almost four hours long. Very rarely in modern society do you sit in front of someone and have a discussion for that period of time. So a lot of people may think that they're, you know, maybe may, maybe lacking some interview skills, but actually you may be just lacking what we would call in jiu-jitsu map time, you know, lacking training or lacking experience talking to people in, in, in a very direct way. You know, everything these days is very, very fast text messages and TikToks and Instagram stories and stuff like that. And very rarely do you kind of, you, you know, try and get that real human connection. So that's what I, that's what I look to get. And um, if people, you know, I've been very lucky that people have responded well and, you know, I have, you know, had to, had some success in, talking to people and getting them to open up a little bit more than maybe than they would normally. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, it's an, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. One thing to disagree. I don't think that you are lucky. I think that you are also, you worked for it. Uh, and yeah, you are a very humble guy. I've seen your interviews. You're also, you have, uh, many talents. You are a guy of many hats. You, you wear many hats and, uh, 
Anyways, I don't want to, you know, how do you say, blow smoke? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, it's it's up, up your ass. That's right. That is right. <laughs> yeah. What, I, what yeah. I would say about the lucky thing is the uh, there's a there's a nice saying that I like, which is the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of those. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So you refer to basically BJJ. So before we go into more functional fitness and weird things that you do in your basement, <laughs> <laughs> other things that people may think of. But let us know a little bit about what you are most uh, known of uh, in Great Britain and in the world, honestly. Yeah, so, you know, my main base and sort of how I identify myself, you know, my core is as a as a grappler, as someone who does Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've been doing that since I was, uh, like I said, 14, 15 years old. I've been doing it longer now than I haven't been doing it uh, in my lifetime. And uh, that's the main thing that I do. And sort of all of the other stuff that I'm known for is sort of peripheral to that is surrounding that the strength and conditioning I started in order to supplement my my grappling. And it it is even though it's kind of taken on a, a path of its own and is a little bit of a hobby as well. Um, I still always those things are, are still very much linked together, the strength and conditioning and the uh, and, and the grappling. So that is what I would be known, you know, known the most for in the grappling community. Uh, but then also, obviously, the strength condition and stuff, just because the combination of a two of the two is a little bit more niche. Um, a lot of people may know me as the grappler that does the <clears throat> weird, weird strength stuff, lifting stones and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to get to that. And it's not only it's also the outfit. I mean, like I told you, you, <laughs> you, you can you, you can certainly make a documentary about yourself. It's, uh, <laughs> it, will be, it will be fun and educational at the same time. Really great. I really enjoy, by the way, your Instagram videos and your podcast about BJJ. Like I said uh, in the preview, I don't know anything about, so I won't be involved. Let us know before. Basically, yeah, to tell me for anybody listening now that's an amateur, that's basically thinking of starting BJJ. Why would he? Why would she? What is the benefit? Yeah, well, whenever I talk about grappling in general or jiu-jitsu in general, whatever you want to call it. I always feel like I might be a little bit biased um, as, as it's such an important thing for me. But, you know, simply put, I believe that the, I believe that grappling, I believe that fighting in general is something that is intrinsically very human. And um, although I don't want to, um, you know, exclude the other sex from it, I think is also extremely masculine as well. And obviously women can uh, grapple and I, I, I'm a big supporter of women who, you know, I love seeing women, w women train martial arts as well. But I think certainly there's something very intrinsic and primordial uh, inside humans and especially men about fighting. And that is something that we've lost in modern culture. And uh, that could be wrestling, aka grappling, or it could be striking as well. Uh, the difference with striking is that striking is always about damage. The, the difference between the two. Striking is 100% about damage. If you do no damage, then you're no good. Whereas grappling, you can do a lot of damage, but it's a lot more about control. So for that reason, I see it as the ultimate style of martial arts, of fighting, to be able to flex the ancient, evolved instincts of humankind without hurting yourself or hurting other people. So I think it's something that everyone should do um, or at least try. Or if they don't like for whatever reason, or if they don't do, at least understand the importance of that style of, uh, of, of, of human combat and how important it is for us as humans. I agree. Because you said something very important. It's lost. It's, it's a lost art. And I think that the men, especially, we have that... Uh, I will call it in the Greek uh, word theme, thumos, you know, thumos. Uh, yes. Basically, in the in Greek, uh, it's called thymos, uh, which is basically the vital energy that motivates uh, men yeah. to be forward. And if you if you think about it, uh, martial art, basically martial, to be martial, is to conquer and to expand and to try to defend also. Well, well, martial, you know, just to, I forget for a second there that I'm speaking to a, to a, to a Greek man, because, you know, Greece is, um, in terms of where I look to both in mythology and also in history, 
I'm a really big fan of Greek culture. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. big, 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 big fan. That is uh, um, something that's very. I actually have right, right here. I'll show you in a second. Is is the uh, the podcast going to go out on video or just audio? Uh, video also. Okay, okay. I'll show you in a sec. But you know, talking about Marshall, Marshall comes from the word Mars. Mars being the Roman name for the Greek god Ares. So it's a, a something that a lot of people don't know. But Marshall comes from essentially the Greek pantheon and Ares, the god of war. And then, of course, for those who, who are into Greek mythology, not just the god of war, but the god of bloody, violent war. Of course, you would have Athena, who was seen as the goddess of wisdom and war, strategic war and tactics. And uh, Ares was the god. He was not looked on very favorably by the other gods when, when, it, when it moved and when it because of course the the romans later on adopted the greek pantheon of gods and they changed the names and some of the gods took on slightly different roles and mars was seen in a lot more favorable light than Ares was but for greek mythology Ares was seen as a as, as not a particular popular god but very much violent so the word martial art you know a lot of people actually see martial art as primarily self-defense and that's how it's used colloquially. That's how it's used today. Even today, I say martial art, meaning sort of the the martial the, the, the fighting styles that don't really work. And then I say fighting art, which is your judo, your wrestling, your jujitsu, your boxing, your kickboxing, your Muay Thai. But actually, martial art is the perfect name for boxing, for MMA, for you know, mixed martial arts, that is actually the perfect name, even though it isn't used that much today. It is not self-defense. It is aggression. It is attack. And wait, I got a uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, bought, I, bought a, uh, I bought an ancient Greek coin recently, mm. a little while ago, and I just got it back a few days ago because I sent it off to a friend of mine to get put on a, on a pendant. I'm not sure if you can see it, but let's try and get it in the camera there. Yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is it? What is it? Is a man. It is. It is Hercules, or how he's modern, how he's normally known, but of course would originally be known in Greek as Heracles. Uh, it's a Heracles choking the the yeah. Nemean lion, and then on the back there is a Athena, which is my favorite goddess. On the back there as well. So, out to the Greeks. I've got a Greek coin about two thousand five hundred <laughs> years old right here. <laughs> Uh, this is a common theme, you know, I, I was uh, in Germany, I was in Munich for six years when I was younger and uh, it was fascinating and both uh, shameful for me to find out that uh, most Germans were much more uh, familiar with uh, the Greek mythology and it was a bit saddening because, you know, it's fascinating indeed. Uh, I like all mythologies, I don't know about you, but I like all mythologies and uh, but when I was a child, for like three years old, four years old, my first books actually were Greek mythology, and I started mm -hmm. reading by, you know, reading Greek mythology, and it was, you know, imprinted in me all the stories uh, about Hercules, uh, Heracles, like you said, uh, and all the goddess, and all the plots, and all the strat mm -hmm. stratagems, and you know, it's a great story, and I think mythology should have a better standing in our society a better, a better you know place maybe even in the schools i don't know well what's your opinion about that yeah absolutely you know again just like with the jujitsu you'll uh, you talk to me about greek mythology mythology in general but especially greek mythology which is my personal favorite of all of them uh and yeah i couldn't agree more i'm very biased in that regard um i believe that myths are important stories and and i think very often in modern society and this may th it's very possible that this is true of all modern societies throughout time or whichever point throughout time they have been considered modern that they always look forward they always look in front they believe that they were greater than the the ones before them and that the ones before them were greater than the ones before that and that humanity is seen as a always moving forward progress and therefore you know an iPhone 10 will always be better than an iPhone 9, which will be better than an iPhone 8, which will be better than the 7. And I think that that's how a lot of people see civilization. But of course, in my opinion anyway, that's not the case. And actually, sometimes the iPhone 10 might come before the iPhone you know, six or seven, it, that, it, that it's not necessarily always in a, in a, in a forward scale. And we lose maybe a lot of 
it can be oversimplified sometimes because our technology is better, our phones are better and our laptops are better and our microphones are better and we have planes and cars, but maybe things like philosophy and wisdom and stuff that isn't so simple to grasp the understanding of actually maybe in the past they had some uh, some 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 superiority in that regard over the modern man. So, you know, I, I believe that looking back at the, you know, we still a lot of the philosophy that we look at today is, of course, come from ancient Greek and Roman times. And we still look at back at that that stuff. And it's important for us not just to look back at the individual works of, you know, be it Plato or Socrates or Archimedes and stuff like that, you know, real pioneers in philosophy and also mathematics and physics and other things that we still use today, but also look back at the mythologies and, 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 and the culture and that entire society that formed those men and women back in the day. So I think it's very important. Agree. And uh, two things about that, basically. First of all, do you know Graham Hancock? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He talks about the same, the same concept, basically, that societies uh, are basically not evolving uh, linear in a linear fashion and time fashion. So sometimes you can have a very ancient civilization before Egyptian times, before, you know, the great Egyptian, you know, dynasties before 5000 BC. And they can be maybe simpler in technology, which is not what is debatable, of course. Yeah. If you if you find out about the pyramids, about the structure, about the geometry, it's mm. fascinating. And the same holds true for Delphi. If you go to the Delphi, uh, I, I've been to Delphi, but uh, and I've seen that. It changes your mood. It changes your the way you feel. It's weird, and the same holds true for param paramagnetism. Do you know the 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 concept? Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Anyways, I don't know why we how how we found ourselves talking <laughs> about <laughs> about that stuff, but Jesus, I didn't know about your interest of, uh, on that. Maybe we should do a complete different uh, podcast on that and uh, <laughs> inform the people. Uh, because I love it too. I love it really. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's always a, I'm very good at getting off at different tangents, but but yeah, my my interests are, uh, um, are very variably eclectic, eclectic, I should say. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know English very well, so. I don't know English very well. So. It I means uh, a very I, yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't I shouldn't be using you know. I forget. I mean, uh, talking to no someone worries, who's, uh, no worries. No worries. English is their second language, but you speak English so well that I forget about it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. It's uh, by the way, it's a custom in Greece. Um, that's why for English people, especially, it's uh, it's a great place to visit because Greece uh, we all are kind of mandatory to learn English from, you know, from very early age, maybe seven, six, seven, eight years old. We all start uh, English. It's like uh, in the school, it's yeah. pretty much mandatory. Uh, yeah. It's in the culture. So, yeah. But we don't know how to speak proper ancient Greek or Greek. So, <laughs> so it's fucked up anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, you should visit at some point Greece. I, I mean... I would love to visit Greece. Uh, I've not been to mainland Greece before, but, you know, obviously as, as someone who has been uh, into ancient Greek history and mythology for so long, you know, I, 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 I am planning a trip around Greece and I really, um, there's very few places in the world that I would rather go um, at the moment than to Greece. And, you know, to Athens, Athens of course, which is, uh, you know, such a hub of, you know, was the center of the world for many, many years. So, uh, yeah, I'd absolutely love to get out to Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you could also combine it, uh, you know, as, because I see you doing very a lot of events, either BJJ or you have a lot of interest. So I talked also with Timothy Schiff. Do you know him? Right? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I also invited him uh, the last year uh, to come here and talk to the rope and stuff, because I mm. believe that Greece uh, most tourists do not know exactly when where to go. Um, they uh, think Santorini, they think uh, Acropolis, and that's about it, really. Uh, <laughs> these are the main attractions, and it's not that they are not beautiful attractions. I mean, if you go to Santorini, it's. Have you been to Santorini? I haven't. No. No. 
So you should go probably <laughs> before you die because it's uh, majestic. It's like going to the moon or something. It's weird. But the whole of Greece has little secrets, li- mm. little secret places like Olympia, like um, Delphi, or like Pelas, which was the birthplace of Alexander the Great. Uh, I mean, it's different than most tourists think it is. Uh, Greece is a lot different than most people think it is. A lot of landscapes. Mm. Anyways, so it's, uh, it's a great... It's a, it's a great thing if you come here, and of course, if you come, uh, text me, let me know to guide you here Absolutely. in Absolutely, uh, in, in 100%, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, having said all that beautiful ancient thing, <laughs> things, <laughs> let's get down to to the main theme of the chat, supposedly. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, how come, let, 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 let's first start from how I found you and how, why I was fascinated by your character and your personality. So... I think I was again uh, in Tim in Tim's channel, and there was a video that you did together. I think mm-hmm. you were all in your basement and you were lifting heavy weights and uh, doing weird things, and there was a Norse music playing in the background. And I was like, first that was weird when I saw it, <laughs> and then it was intriguing. Was, what are these guys these guys doing there in the basement? And the music was beautiful. I might add. And then I saw your your tools and the things you did, and then I dived into to your Instagram and your thing, and I, and, and I was, it was the first time for me because many people in fitness, you know, we know the basics, mm. we know the gyms, you know, we know the machines, you know, the programming, uh, programming exercises and uh, muscles and blah blah blah, the very basic stuff. Mm. But then I see you and you're doing out of this world stuff and you're wearing only your jeans your <laughs> how you, <laughs> your how do you say this in uh, is a term uh my performance enhancing denim yes exactly <laughs> exactly and i was fascinated so how came this to be yeah i guess the you, you know it's always funny when uh people talk about my strength training stuff because for so many people it is like you said very strange very weird stuff that they haven't seen before whereas for me if i go into a gym and i see people doing machines it's very strange to me it's that's what i consider weird i do what i do i consider it normal and what most people would consider as normal i consider to be strange and i guess that's a natural evolution a divergence of uh of of just where i you know i was on the path I got into fitness and I got into strength training, you know, with a desire to become stronger for my grappling. And, um, you know, I, I, I slowly diverted away off of that path. And then, you know, the further you're on a different route, the further away that you get. And then that's that's where we look at now. And, and, and the reason for that was mainly because, uh, well, I, I, I got into strength training. I joined a commercial gym when I was about 16 years old. And I was reading a book at the time called Dinosaur Training by Brooks Kubik. You might know it. And uh, he he hates the commercial gym world. And he says, forget about that. Forget about the fancy machines. You just need a thick bar. You need some weights. You need to do curls and presses and deadlift and squat and bench and row. And that's all you need. So I took it to heart. And, you know, when I was 16 or 17, probably 17 years old, I canceled my gym membership and instead I just bought a, a thick bar with like 90 kilos of weights and, and, and that's it. I just had that one bar, just one thing and, and, and you know, everything else, any, all, all the other equipment that I used was stuff that I just had made together, DIY stuff, chains and ropes and cardboard boxes and everything. And I started training like that. And that's basically was, was, was the birth point and the, the beginning of the evolution into what I do today and slowly you know cleared out the garage and started to, to 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 get acquire more equipment over the years and continue down that that path and then you know get into sandbags and get into stone lifting and get more into grip training because with the jiu-jitsu the grip is such an important part so naturally as a, as a, as a grappler i was interested in the grip training aspect 
and uh and yeah that's that's where i got to today so just a natural evolution from the starting point that i got and you know doing different experiments with different things and 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 learning and experience you know i've been lifting lifting weights for probably 10 to 12 years now so consistently so over that time you learn things and you change your training strategies it's fascinating you know how if you are a young person if you are 16 15 17 teenager an mm-hmm. adolescent how better your progress can be if you take the proper knowledge or the proper mentor you know because a book is a mentor yeah fact. yeah for example i ha- i had for many years the same last to be outside and exercise outside for many years now because it's my personality too in a way but i never had that uh, push so i never had somebody or maybe i never came across a book that uh, was like what you said the mm. dinosaur fitness dinosaur training yeah dinosaur training yeah thus i struggled uh, i struggled for many years i was trying the proper gyms but i i always had you know a weird feeling about them you know the music wasn't my choice the lights were, were a bit off uh, everything mm. sa- seemed a little bit too too off uh, it wasn't uh, also it wasn't very exciting it was very repetitive yeah. and that's why for for the past years i'm for at least four years i'm getting outside in this under the sun semi-naked you know the grandmas are fascinated by that <laughs> they enjoy my they enjoy my beautiful, not very uh, muscular body yet, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> they enjoy it nevertheless. And I would wish, that's what I'm trying to say, I would wish that was there was a motivation in me maybe or somebody to push me. And I want you to share with us, what was your motivation to find the book? Did you find it on your own? Was there a mentor, an uncle, uh, a father, somebody, a friend? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. And 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 you make a good point there and uh you know i've never seen it as that but you're right that the many things in everyone's life there are many times sometimes many sometimes once sometimes never but very often there's a one point one moment it can be one person it can be one book it could be one film it could be one accident it could be anything that changes the course of their life i could definitely say that that um you know, finding jujitsu was one and reading this book was another. And would I have still got to the same place if I hadn't read the book? I don't know. Who knows? That's kind of the, would I get to the same place anyway? I don't know. But certainly that I always, you know, almost every interview I've ever had, I've mentioned that book really a thousand times, you know. Um, And the answer to where, where I got it from, I don't even know. I can't remember. It's one of those things where the mentor you know, finds you, you know, the mysterious cloak figure finds you and and he's the master. I don't remember. Maybe a friend gave it to me or someone at training recommended it to me. I I kind of have a feeling that that they did, but whatever it was, it came at the right time when I was looking for training. And then after maybe a year or two of me training with that mentality, I met a strength and conditioning coach who was training jujitsu with us. And he did become my mentor in strength and conditioning for many years and kind of using the the philosophy that I'd already got from dinosaur training and combined with the knowledge uh, and then my own experimentation and my own curiosity to continue to learn and to test and to experience. Uh, And, you know, some people, you're never too old to find that spark that changes the way that you do it. You know, some people will train in in a place for a long time and, but you know, you could be very, you know, you could be 50, 60, 70 and suddenly start, Tra- you know change your complete philosophy on training and health and well-being and and also have an open mind you know what i think about training today is very different to what i thought about training five years ago and i kind of hope in five years time what i think then will be different from what i think today even though i would hate to think that what i think of today is wrong i'm also open and accept the fact that maybe there will be some po- aspects about it that I will evolve my thoughts on and I'll think differently in five years. I think if you're not training your, changing your ideas, there's there's a very careful balance that you need to strike between consistency throughout. There needs to be consistency in some regard, but also open-mindedness to change certain things. And it's a very hard balance. You have some people who will do squat, deadlift, bench press for 
50 years and then die. That's it. They never do anything else. They start doing it when they're 20 or 15 years old, squat, bench, deadlift, and then they do it until they stop working out at whatever age that is. And I find it a little bit sad. But then other people who they'll do, you know, one year of bodybuilding, then one year of bench press, and then one year of ultra marathons, and then one year of this, and, and kind of flip flop into completely different philosophies. Maybe that's a little bit too much the other side. So it's striking a balance between some consistency and also open mindedness to continue to learn and evolve and change. Wow. You explained it very, very, very well. I never thought it that way, but it is really the balance. I was that guy, but by, by the way, I was the guy that was flip-flopping. <laughs> yeah. I was that guy when I was uh, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. For five years, I was doing swimming. Then I was dropping out from swimming. I was doing uh, machines, then free weights. I tried, failed, then running, I sucked. And you know, then I, for the past three, four years mainly, I'm more consistent, but trying to incorporate what you said, not being too stung about, too rigid. So try to find, bring new ideas to improve the game, which basically, if, if you keep, I find done that if you keep the eye uh, to the prize, how do you say this? Yeah, on the prize, yeah. On the prize, yes. I, I find it more easy, easily. So in everything in life, whether that's... Um, getting stronger uh, or, you know, having a more carved physique or probably getting more ladies, uh, more success with ladies um, or anything in life. If you have your eyes on the prize uh, in the long term, then the short term and the mid term and all the, the, you know, the changes that you probably need to make are not going to frustrate you because you know that the prize and the journey, of course, has the merit, has merit, mm -hmm. but the the prize is what matters and the prize is usually something great something big something that's for me at least something that's not easily attainable so that i can always you know have it as my north star you know mm -hmm. and to look at it and okay it's fine so that's something i along with your beautiful thing that you said which i'm going to use uh, more now in my brain uh, that 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 also is another theory that i have that um if you have your north star and you focus on that Everything else has no, no really cannot sadden you or even you, you cannot uh, have great joy. And there is a thing that the uh, ancient Greeks also said about it. And it's a very famous uh, quote. And in Greek, it's called uh, metron ariston. And metron is basically the balance. And ariston means uh, aristia, aristotel means perfect, perfection. Mm -hmm. And the perfection lies in the balance. And when I was younger, I was like, uh, you know, in my fumes, I wanted a lot of girls, only beautiful girls, uh, many thousands. And I wanted to be superhuman, Hercules, <laughs> physique. And, you know, I was training wrong and I was doing mass action, but I was doing it very wrong. I, was, I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't contemplating about it. So I was heading on like a horse, but I was going to the wrong directions all mm -hmm. the way and flip flopping also. No consistency, like you said. And I think uh, now that I'm 30, I don't know, probably you are 32 or something. I'm 30 as well, yeah. 30, 30 as well, yeah. great. But yeah, yeah, I think that, uh, I think the maturity of our age, I don't know about you, how do you what do you think about it? But I think uh, when I see younger guys now uh, in their teens or, the, or 20s, early 20s, I see the same flame in them, the same fire and the same, you know, ultra motivation, the same, you know, uh, they want to kick ass everywhere at the mm. same time and do everything uh, at perfection, but they don't contemplate, they don't take a step back and bring new ideas. They are too proud. You mm. know, they are too, if I go and say something to them, they will, they will laugh about it. I, mm. I did that, by the way, in the few days past, and I tried to help a young man, but I, I don't know if everybody is like that, but they were, you know, they were in in their way. I mean, they they seem to stumble upon their own mistakes. Uh, what do you think about younger guys and older mm. guys in training? What do you think of their mistakes? Yeah. So, firstly, you know, two things there. Uh, I just wanted to kind of combine what I said about consistency and flip flopping with what you were saying about having this guiding star. And actually, I, what you're talking about is the same. And what you can say in that in that analogy is. The consistency is the guiding star, you know, having the consistency of what you want and then being able to be open to everything around. And I think 
very early on in training, people tend to flip flop and it's okay as long as it's not for too long. Because five years of you doing bodybuilding and swimming and powerlifting and this and that teaches you and it's experience that allows you to then really work out not just what you want, but also how to get it. So that's not to say that, you know, experience is very important. It kind of goes into the second question, which is about youngsters. And, you, you know, of course, everyone knows that with age comes wisdom. And when you're 16, 18 years old, you think you know it all. You think you're fully grown and you know everything there is to know. And of course, at 30 years old, you look back at an 18 year old, even my 18 year old self, and you go, how ignorant, how stupid, how foolish and unwise I was. And I'm sure in 10 years and in 20 years and in 30 years, I would look back at myself at 30 and say the same thing. I think you always think that you're grown. Maybe by the time you're 30, you realize you start to see the pattern and you go, well, maybe I'm not. I still have stuff to learn. Or maybe at least I believe by, by the age that we are that you should be wise enough to know that you don't know everything. It's uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Do you know this? The Dunning-Kruger. This is the, yes, the yeah. sharp upward spike. It's a, it's a confidence competency matrix or a, a graph. It's a very sharp upward spike followed by a, a pretty sharp decline and then a very slow upward spike. So when you're very young, you think you know everything, but you don't know anything. And then you realize you don't know anything and it drops down and then it slowly goes back up to, uh, you know, I would imagine at the end there being a wise elder, um, you know, with, with, with all the wisdom and all the knowledge because you have all the experience. So, yeah, you know, I think that, that youngsters can absolutely fall into those holes. And I think, uh, but at the same time, there's sort of a paradox with trying to teach anyone anything, but especially those who are a bit younger. But it certainly goes for any age. I've taught jiu-jitsu for a long time as well. So uh, I'm used to teaching people of all different ages um, and all different levels. And when you when you experience a lot of things and you gain the knowledge and the wisdom from experience, you want to pass that knowledge on without having the person go through the same experiences. The problem is if they don't go through those experiences, they won't truly understand the value of that knowledge. So you can tell someone don't do this, you'll regret it, but they won't really believe it. They won't really truly deeply understand it, even if they think they do, until they have walked that same road and made the same mistakes. So that's sort of the paradox is you want to tell someone something so they don't make the same mistake, but they won't listen to you until they make the mistake. And then they try and tell the next person not to make the mistake and they don't listen to them until they make the next mistake. So again, it's about balance, balancing that experience and that wisdom. You need to experience some stuff, but you want to kind of take some some cheating steps as well, where you can take the wisdom without having to go through all of the experiences. Are you sure you are not from Greece or you don't have <laughs> Greek ancient Greek philosophic genes? I have. Uh, and, and, yeah, <laughs> I have. I did. So I did a DNA test. And I'm mainly Southern, uh, Southern European. So Italy and Cyprus and uh, Iberian and Aegean. So I think, I think, uh, I think. Is that, real? Some... Is that for real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell dark skin. I'm not, I'm not English. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny. Uh, when I, when I, when I see your podcast and your, you know, you're relaxed, you know. So uh, if you come here to Greece, for example, the culture, It's, people say in England, in Germany, in in the Nordic uh, countries, they they think that Greeks are uh, lazy, mm. but uh, in fact, Greeks, it's our um, mentality uh, to be laid down, uh, relaxed. Not that, yeah. that we don't work, but uh, especially with that heat here, we have yeah. uh, you know our summers are great, but uh, sometimes it gets a little bit too warm, if you know what I mean. Um, it's very and, warm today in England. It's very for us. It's very warm today. Ah, uh, thirty thirty-one degrees today is hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Meanwhile,
That's funny. That's funny. I think it's the hottest day of the year today. That's cute. <laughs> 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 yeah, we had uh, 40, I think. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. hot. Yeah. But, you know, every country has its uh, merits. So. Yeah, that's true. By the way, I have a couple or three more questions. Uh, do you have time to go for 10 more minutes or should yeah, I yeah, ask yeah, one I could, question? I could, I could do exactly 10 minutes. I've got to oh, go awesome. training at 6. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, all right, let me get quick. So regarding now, let's get to the training stuff. Uh, regarding the grid training and the sandbox and stone lifting, mm. do, uh, if somebody now listen to us and he tries to find a new way to train, you know, he tries to incorporate more things into his, uh, you know, bench press and all the, you know, moves, the classic ones. Why would somebody, in a nutshell, why would somebody who is a little bit experienced, not that you know, amateur, why would he go with sandbag and grip training? What are the merits? So, you know, grip training is all, you know, my philosophy around grip training is very simple. For me as a, as a, as a grappler, I need to be able to get a hold of my opponent and control them. For someone who doesn't have to worry about that, I think that you still take the same, you still take the same philosophy of who doesn't want to have powerful hands, powerful wrists, powerful arms, when you can be as strong as you want in your back and your chest and your shoulders and your biceps. But if you can't connect that strength to the outside world through your hands, then it's pretty useless in a real world scenario. I think for me, I guess if I had to sum my training philosophy up in, in one sentence, it would be, it needs to work in the real world. You know, tra being strong just in the gym is pointless to me. It has to work outside the gym. I'm not just training to, to do a big bench press. I'm not just training to do a big squat. I'm training to be able, for me personally, outside of the gym means wrestling with another human. But it might be lifting a sandbag to help someone. It might be lifting a car off of someone. It might be, you know, pulling a tree out of the ground that someone needs to be moved. It could mean all of these things, but it has to. I, I don't play a lot of video games, even though I really enjoy them sometimes. And I was playing a lot of video game. Uh, uh, I was playing a lot of Call of Duty recently, you know, maybe half an hour, an hour every night. And I stopped a few weeks ago. I said, I'm not doing this anymore because the problem with the video games is you, you get good at something and it only works in that video game. Getting good at Call of Duty doesn't make you better at Super Mario. And getting better at Super Mario doesn't make you better at, you know, FIFA. So just being able to be good at something in that little world, it's not enough for me. Just being strong in the gym, it's not enough for me. I want to be strong outside. And this that philosophy encompasses that question of stones, sandbags, and grip. The grip, having a strong grip is your connection to the, a lot of the outside world because we use our hands. And sandbags and stones, well, stones and are natural things that happen outside anyway they're not designed to be lifted in the same way that a barbell a dumbbell a kettlebell is designed to be lifted it's just a rock and then a sandbag to me is just another version of a rock it's just a safer simpler easier to to, to manipulate and to change the weight of and to measure it's an easier version of a rock or of a stone you know the sandbag it's not easy to grab onto. It's hard to grab onto. You're fighting it the entire time. So that is my main philosophy. The sum up in a, in, in a sentence is it's got to work in the real world, whatever that means to the individual. And for me, I believe that having a strong grip and having the ability to lift things that aren't designed to be lifted, such as sandbags and rocks, that's an important part of that. Yeah. Multidimensional uh, is what I'm thinking as a word here for what you say. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, it's great. I had the same problem with uh, video games, by the way. Um, I always was very good at them. I was proud to be very good at them when I was a young uh, adolescent guy. Uh, but then I figured out that uh, first of all, the skills there do not translate to the real life. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, was uh, saddening because when you invest thousands of hours, yeah, it's a little bit saddening, you know, to see yourself in the real life struggling to talk to strangers, struggling to talk to girls, not being able to have a firm handshake. Uh, I always had the very weak handshake, and still it's my weakest point. That's that, that's why I found your Instagram fascinating. 
and following all the crazy stuff that you're doing. By the way, one uh, shortly, the exercises, all these crazy exercises, why do you think these were are important? All the unilateral ones that you do, yeah. why do you think, in, in a minute, why do you think these are important for somebody to incorporate along with his bilateral movements like, you know, squats or pressings and stuff? Well, you know, you you already summed it up perfectly. It's got to be diverse. It's got to be, um, you, you know, multi-exercises. And, you know, t- one-arm stuff is good because it, it's rotation, it's movement. It's, it's very rarely in the real world do you ever get to use two hands exactly the same. Even if you're pushing something off of you, one hand might be lower down than the other one. It might be staggered. So, so yeah, you know, one hand and, you know, different ranges of motion and strange ranges of motion and pushing and putting at the same time and, you know, lifting up different things with different grips. All of that is about creating strength that translates over into the real world. And that is not to say that simple exercises are ineffective or that I don't use them. You know, doing a bent over row or a pull up or a bench press or a deadlift or a squat. These are all fantastic exercises. All these exercises are tools to be used and they can be used and they're still effective, but they're not the be all and end all. And the accessory stuff is a lot of the stuff where I'm doing the weirder stuff. Yeah, yeah, very well, very well. All right, last question then. My last question is very simple. Basically, what do you see in 2021, 2022 for you? And what do you wish for the world, for the fitness guy, people that they are, you know, locked up in their homes mm. and the situation is a little bit dire for many people. They don't seem to find, you know, an excuse to go to, to exercise. Uh, so these two, first, Talk about yourself and then what's about the people uh, last uh, wish? Yeah, for myself, you know, it is hard at the moment, uh, especially with traveling and doing things. It's something that I, I used to do quite a lot and travel around to teach and to train and to explore and to you know, lift stones and stuff like that. But, you know, I still uh, I have uh, grappling competitions and plans for competition that I want to do and to get back to teaching like I wasn't able to do last year in the first half of this year. And hopefully to do more traveling and stuff like that uh, and to go and lift stones in different countries and go and explore places. I'd love to get out to Greece in 2022 um, and I'll let you know if I ever do. Uh, but yeah, so I'd like to get out and, and do the, you know, just get out and get back to doing what I haven't been able to do for the last year, really, which is te- teaching jujitsu, competing in jujitsu and exploring the world and and lifting stones and finding ancient stones to lift and stuff like that. In terms of what I would like to see from the world, I think that there are, you know, there are some benefits maybe. Uh, The silver lining to the pandemic for a lot of people is that they have taken control of their own health and their own fitness, or at least they should have. I know a lot of people have, and sure, a lot of people haven't, but realizing that you don't need a gym to train, and that you can take control of it. You don't need to go to gym classes. Teach yourself how to train. Find stuff that you enjoy. Get out, out. You know, like we you spoke about. Get outside. It doesn't matter if it's raining. Get outside and enjoy the rain because that's you know there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit wet and take your shoes off and walk around in 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 in, in on the grass or on the sand or in the mountains or whatever, and take control of your destiny and your fate by taking control of your health because you you know the one the most disappointing thing from this whole pandemic is that a pandemic by its very nature is a crisis of health and whilst there's been lots of talk of social distancing and work from home and masks and vaccines there hasn't been enough about health and diet and mental health and you know empowering people to you know really take care of themselves in the best way and that's been disappointing to see that there's been no real push to do that and we have to take control of that ourselves awesome (laughs) you described exactly what i like in life and what i ascribe to Mm. so before we go uh let us know of your channels uh when can people find you dan yeah, so like, like you mentioned already, the main place that you can find me is on Instagram. It is at raspberry underscore ape. That's raspberry the fruit and ape like a gorilla. And you can also find my website, which is raspberryape.com. I have a grip training instructional on there. 
and then my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Raspberry Ape. Basically, if you search for Raspberry Ape, you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Thanks for coming on, man. My I, pleasure. It was, it was my pleasure, too. You are really a very good podcasting. You make it very easy for everybody, for you, probably, <laughs> and, and the other guy. <laughs> So thanks, and I hope to see you in Greece at some point in 2022. And everybody who listens, yeah, go subscribe to uh, Raspberry Apes, uh, Instagram, YouTube, everything. Thank you very much for having me, and I'll definitely hit you up. I, I really want to get out to Greece and and, oh, uh, yeah. and go and experience the land and the culture and the history Ooh. and and everything. I, I really that it, 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 I'm not just saying that it's one of the places on the top of my list to go and visit. That's awesome, man. When you come, we could do some uh, videos here. Definitely. Would, yeah, and great food, man. I don't know if you like food, but... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, cuisine is beautiful. Anyways. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Thank you very okay. much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, have a nice training, by the way. Cheers, brother. Thank you very much.